Hello and welcome to Roots and Shoots. This week we're looking into Revelation chapter 7. If you joined us last week you'll know that we were looking at the first six seals and before we get to the seventh seal in chapter 8 we have a, a little interruption if you like um, where John has another couple of visions and we're going to read those through and look at those together. So Revelation chapter 7 and starting at verse 1. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. From the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing round the throne, and round the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne, and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honour and power and strength be to our God for ever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the centre of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the visions that John had that are recorded for us here in the book of Revelation. And as we're getting into uh, some of the, the more difficult passages to understand, we ask you to give us wisdom and insight from your Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to hear you speaking to us clearly. And above all else, may we take from today's study something that really makes a difference in our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you remember last week, we were looking at the seals that are recorded in Revelation chapter 6. We know that there were seven seals on the scroll and here we have the six that we looked at last week. When the first seal was broken, there was the rider who went out on conquest. Then there was the rider who went out causing strife. There was the rider called famine and the rider called death. And then when the fifth seal was broken, we see the... Uh, 
a picture of persecution. Uh, under the altar, the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. There was no rider for the fifth seal, nor was there a rider for the sixth. But when the sixth seal was broken, we see the end of all things as we know them, the end of, of the earth and God preparing for the new heavens and the new earth. We see the day of the Lord that's prophesied about elsewhere uh, in, in the Bible, in New Testament and Old Testament. And so in those passages, uh, we see, I was going to say a sequence. Is it a sequence? And that's one of the questions that I want us to be considering today, because one of the things that I've mentioned to you as we've gone through is that even though, for instance, this passage starts by saying, after this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. Does this mean that prophetically the events that John is seeing are happening in a sequential order? And so after all the breaking of the six seals, it then leads on to this vision of the four angels and on to the vision of the 144,000. Or does it mean something slightly different to that? There are a couple of other questions that I also would like you to consider in a pause time where you hit the pause button and look at the passages, well, the passage that we've read uh, and consider how you would answer these questions. So here we go. Do you think the events in verse one to three happened after the events of the first six seals? Look at what the first six events were and then look at what it says here. Remember, this is not the seventh seal. Um, and it's a little bit a um, little bit confusing because it does talk about God's people being sealed, which is a slightly different thing to the seal on the scrolls. Then uh, talking about the 144,000, we have a list here of the 12 tribes of Israel. And of course, those names trip off your tongue, don't they? So as I read this, I'm sure that you thought, yeah, yeah, tick, 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 all 12, all home and safe. But is it? So what I'd like you to do is look at Deuteronomy chapter 27 and verses 12 to 13, where there is a list of the 12 tribes of Israel. And I want you to compare these two lists. And can you spot any differences? Clue there are a couple. And then thirdly, just have a look and see what is promised to those who come out of the great tribulation. So let's take a pause, come back and join me when you've had a chance to consider these questions. See you in a moment. Well, I wonder how you've got on with uh, those questions. The first question is this question of the order of events. We are so used to things being given to us in a sequential order. You know, our history teachers started back at the beginning and, and took us through what they considered to be significant events. But of course, although history happens in a chronological order, there was no obligation on the teachers to actually teach us this happened, then this happened, then this happened the teachers could pick and choose from history the events that they felt were key and how they influenced other things that happened. And it's the same in a story. You, you may actually think that when you read a story, you are getting the, the story from A to B, from the beginning to the end. Of course, in many cases, you're not. And the author will reveal some things to you by a narration of something going on now, but then you might get flashbacks or then you might get some kind of revelation that says, uh, sorry, that wasn't meant to be a pun, but, but the author will reveal something that you didn't know that helps you to understand that what you've just read, there were other things going on in the background. And let's face it, if we look at those six seals, the last one was the end of all things. It was the day of the Lord. And the only thing that happens after that is God's judgment and 
the righteous go to be with Christ uh, for eternity and uh, the dead uh, go uh, to to uh, where God has directed that they will be. And we'll be looking more at that. It may I may have sounded a bit cagey there in what I said, but uh, there's more to come in the book of Revelation about what happens to us when we die and what happens to us ultimately as believers and as unbelievers. So we'll park that thought just for now uh, and we'll study that when the time comes. The reality is that if we look at these first three verses, there are four angels standing at the four corners of the earth who are holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any from blowing on the land. But there's another angel who comes up from the east, who has the seal of the living God, and he calls out to the four angels who've been given power to harm the land and the sea. Don't harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. We just had a picture of the, the things that happen after the first six seals are opened and we reveal what's already written there. And many of the things that are in those seals are happening simultaneously and some things are happening at the time they're written, but perhaps unseen to uh, God's people at the time. But remember, of course, the revelation starts with the letters to the seven churches and God is saying this is written for you back in that uh, early time uh, of the early church. Revelation is written to give them encouragement and courage for the situation that they are in. But as we've had the the unveiling of of those things that are happening in um, in chapter six, including the persecution and the martyrdom of some believers, we have this moment when we're taken back to see that before all of that happens, before the four angels are let loose to uh, cause the devastation that uh, they're allowed to cause, there's another angel who says, let me seal God's servants first. And then when these things happen, God's people will be known as God's people because they will have his seal on their foreheads. So when we say that the prophecies in Revelation are not linear, they're not chronological, here's a classic example that illustrates that. And I want you to take this on board. We have the picture in chapter six of things that would be fearful if we didn't belong to Christ. Now we have the simple promise that before any of these things happened, we are sealed and there is a mark on us that marks us out as God's people. When we look a few chapters time, we'll be thinking about the mark of the beast. Before the mark of the beast, God has put his mark on us. And I think that's a tremendous, a tremendous prom promise. The after this doesn't mean after this chronologically. It means that when that vision had finished, the next vision was this one. And it doesn't mean that this one has happened after that one, the first one. It just means that they've been revealed in this order. It's not a unique story. If you turn to Ezekiel chapter 9, and uh, I did put a marker in it, so I should be able to turn to it fairly quickly. Here we go. Ezekiel chapter 9, and just the first six verses. Then I heard him call out in a loud voice, Bring near those who are appointed to execute judgment on the city, each with a weapon in his hand. And I saw six men coming from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with a deadly weapon in his hand. With them was a man clothed in linen who had a writing kit at his side. They came in and stood beside the bronze altar. Now the glory of the God of Israel went up from above the cherubim where it had been and moved to the threshold of the temple. 
Then the Lord called to the man clothed in linen who had the writing kit at his side and said to him, Go throughout the city of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of those who grieve and lament over all the detestable things that are done in it. As I listened, he said to the others, Follow him through the city and kill without showing pity or compassion. Slaughter the old men, the young men and women, the mothers and children, but do not touch anyone who has the mark. Begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the old men who were in the front of the temple. Can you see? God has somebody going out on his behalf, marking his people with a special seal. And then death follows. But death knows it can't touch those who belong to God, those who are his possession. And of course we know, don't we, in Eph from Ephesians chapter 1, that God tells us that when we are in him, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. Please, as we study these graphic things in the book of Revelation, don't be fearful. Be encouraged that God has promised that he has marked you as his own. So then uh, the next question I gave you was about the list of the, the tribes in this chapter. I did the exercise myself by, um, I don't know whether you'll be able to see this because the lighting's not very good this afternoon, but uh, down one side I listed the tribes in Deuteronomy, down the other side I listed the tribes in Revelation. And you'll notice, uh, so the Simeon, Levi were the first two mentioned, but they come halfway down the list in Revelation. Judah was the third, but he's moved up to the top. And similarly, Reuben down here is moved up to number two. And what we find as we go through and we check them out from this list, the one that's missing is Dan. And in this list, the one that is new is Manasseh. So we have Joseph down here. And in some of the lists of the children, the tribes of Israel, um, instead of seeing Joseph, we will see Ephraim and Manasseh, who were his children. And uh, we see that they're listed as tribes in some places. But here we've got Joseph and we've got Manasseh. So Joseph is listed as a tribe. Manasseh, one of his children, also listed as a tribe. But Dan is the one down here who has disappeared, was on list number one and isn't on the list in the book of Revelation. What's the significance of that? I think one of the interesting things is that Judah comes first because, of course, we're looking at the lamb in Revelation who's also called the lion of the tribe of Judah and Jesus was from the tribe of Judah by his human descent. And uh, he was also a descendant of David. Uh, and so naturally, because he is the redeemer, his tribal name comes first. But what we then see is in uh, the Deuteronomy passage, there were some tribes who were appointed to bless and some tribes who were appointed to curse. And after Judah, we get most of the people, the tribes who were designated to curse and the ones who were designated to bless come later. Dan, the tribe that is missing, the name of Dan means judge. I don't know if there's any significance in that. But because now Christ is the judge, this is the final judgment. And so the tribe with the name judge is no longer there. And Manasseh, a son of Joseph, is inserted. Well, uh, I'll let you reflect on those things. The commentators do have some quite interesting ideas as to why there is this slight chop and change. But the general conclusion is that uh, it's not critical. 
um, nor is it a contradiction, but that so much of what's in Revelation is symbolic. And that brings us on to the question of the 144,000. Probably one of the key numbers in Revelation, apart from the number 666, that most people are aware of. And so there is this idea of 144,000, if you like, special people who are sealed by God. Those who interpret Revelation as all of it is to happen in the future see this as an actual number living during the future great tribulation immediately before the return of Christ. And then uh, people start to look at the numbers and start to do all sorts of calculations and uh, try and work out what these numbers actually mean and put some kind of uh, meaning to them if they can. Um, interestingly, let me show you a calculation that I came across as I was reading. Let me see what you think of this. So uh, someone has said that three is the number of God. Uh, interesting because for many people they would say, well, God's number is seven, but this is what was written. Three is God's number. Four is creation's number. And so three times four is 12. And that means the church. 12 squared is 144, which means the whole church. 10 is the number of completeness. And again, I'm not quite sure where that comes from, but this person seemed to think that this was the case. But if you look at what happens in the Bible that comes in tens, like the Ten Commandments, the Ten Plagues and so on, I'm not sure it quite fits. But they say 10 is the number of completeness. If you cube the number 10, in other words, you take it into three dimensions, that gives you wholeness and completeness three dimensional completeness so if you take your 12 squared times your 10 cubed it represents the whole church in its completeness hmm i don't know what you think of that but that's uh, an interesting calculation and i have to say i'm really not convinced partly because i think the numbers are very contrived and actually because why would God give you a book that says this is for you to to understand? This is to give you strength and courage in the circumstances that are going to be happening to you now and in the future. Why would God lock it into such a mystery that if you didn't know how to use a calculator and uh, work these things out, that this would remain a mystery to you forever? Let me just encourage you to look at the what it actually says here. And see what you can glean from that. See, God knows even the hairs of our head. Jesus told us that even the hairs of our head were numbered in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 30. If he knows us down to that detail, uh, he's not going to miscount his children. But if these numbers are symbolic, he's giving a number and there may well be a meaning behind that number. But he's telling us that these are his people. And what I want you to notice is that John doesn't actually see 144,000 people. Do you notice this? He sees the four angels. He sees the an, another angel coming up, calling out in a loud ver voice to the four angels. And he goes out to do the sealing. And then we say, or we read in verse 4, I heard the number of those who were sealed. He doesn't actually see a vision of 144,000 people who are sealed. He just knows that that's what's reported about the angel going out to seal God's children. And so then when we come to this idea of, well, there are 12,000 from each of these 12 tribes, does that mean a literal 12,000 and that they are literally only from the 12 tribes of Israel? Well, in verse 9, what have we got? After this, I looked. Oh, there it is again. Does that mean that after seeing the 144,000, which we just learned he didn't see, 
he then goes on to see a great multitude. Or does this mean, you see, if you looked at a crowd, you would not be able to tell whether there were 144,000 people. If you looked at Wembley Stadium when it was full for a cup final uh, back in the old days, uh, you would only know how many people were there because you would know how many seats there were. And they would be able to tell you how many people came through the barrier. But let's take a demonstration in London. How many people would be at that demonstration? Well, they don't physically check in. And the only thing you can do is make an estimate. John now sees a group of people and all he can see is that there's a great multitude. He can't count them. He probably can't even see the whole multitude. There are so many. But what he can tell us is that, that uh, no one could count it and that from every nation, tribe, people, language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, there was this great crowd of people. Don't feel that 144,000 people from the tribe of Israel excludes you because you can say, I belong in this great crowd. And just why they are depicted as from the 12 tribes of Israel in the, in the uh, vision before, we don't need to worry about. What we can say is that there are an uncountable multitude of people in heaven sealed by God who are standing before him. Incidentally, that idea of standing before him, just look at that last verse of chapter 6. When uh, the John is talking about the, the day of the wrath of the Lamb, and it says in verse 17, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? Who can stand up to it? And the answer is here in the next chapter. The ones who have been sealed are the ones who can stand. And here we see this multitude standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. They cried out with a loud voice and so on. Well, we can go on to look in a little bit more detail about the white robes that they were wearing. We could look at the palm branches that they were holding. Was that reminiscent of the entry into Jerusalem or was it reminiscent of the Feast of Tabernacles? Where at the Feast of Tabernacles, which was also the harvest festival for the Israelites, they remembered the Exodus. And because in the Exodus they lived in tents, during the Feast of Tabernacles they slept under palm branches so that they could see the stars. And they recognised that God had delivered them. And I was in a, a Jewish house doing a, one of my inspections um, about a year or so ago. And in their kitchen, they had a, a specially designed lantern in the ceiling that opened up completely. So that on the Feast of Tabernacles, they could lay palm branches across the lantern and they could sleep indoors, but still fulfil their responsibility uh, to actually sleep as it were, under the stars, with palm branches over them. Well, our third question was, what is promised to those who come out of the Great Tribulation? And let's remember, we've already looked at how actually this tribulation was happening to the church at the time, and it's been happening ever since. And those who overcome, they're given all sorts of promises in the letters, aren't they? And here, um, I sum them up as S's. Let me tell you what I got. First of all, they serve him day and night in his temple. They're given service to do. Heaven isn't going to be sitting around playing your harp unless that's the service God has appointed to you, you to. They were given shelter. Shelter from the sun um, uh, and shelter from any other kind of problem. They were given food. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. So they were always satisfied. They were given a shepherd. The lamb at the centre of the throne will be their shepherd. Isn't that ironic? But isn't that a great promise? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And then he'll lead them to springs of living water. 
and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. I put that down as solace, comfort, service, shelter, satisfaction, a shepherd and solace. And they're not the only promises, are they? Let's give thanks to God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this glimpse into some of the things that are going on in the, the world around us that we may not understand, but also the things that are to come, the promises that you have for us. We thank you that we have been sealed uh, by your Holy Spirit, that we bear your name, that, Lord, as we face trials and tribulations, whatever we may face, that we know that you are in control of our destiny and our future. So we ask, Lord, you would give us courage to serve you now as well as in the future. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining me this week. Uh, between now and the next time I'll do a recording, it will be Christmas. So I hope you have a really uh, good day and a day when you can spend time thinking about the real meaning of Christmas. And I'll look forward to our next study, which will be on Revelation chapter 8. Have a great week. <laughs>